Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, psychotherapist and the author and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director in our studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I will share with you the tip of the week about the essence of receiving and experiencing love um, and sharing love in our life. And I chat with Lauren Reitzma and Janine uh, McKenzie. They are the authors of Relationship Essentials, Skills to Feel Her, Fight Fair, and Set Boundaries in All Areas of Life and uh, founders of the Center for Relationship Education. You can find them at myrelationshipcenter.org. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast and connect with me through Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, any of them. And I'd like to hear from you. I want to hear your comments, um, what shows you like, what topics you like, any questions you have from, a, from me as a therapist or a coach. I'd love to hear from you and um, put it back in, um, in the show for you. Um, I have two uh, events going on, so uh, here it is. of you amazing psychotherapists and life coaches around the world you have the opportunity to become certified in the awareness integration theory and uh, the, the interventions which will give you access to be featured in uh, the awarenessintegration.com and the fujan app uh, which in both they people will be able to find you and um want to share with you and work with you, uh, knowing that you are going to be proficient in giving them the awareness integration model. So it's important for all of you to come in to the next course that we have. Um, it will be February 18th to 20th and um, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's gonna be 18 hours online. The awareness integration therapy uh, or theory is a multi-modality psychological educational model that enhances self-awareness, releases past traumas and psychological blocks, reduces the symptoms of anxiety and depression, and promotes clarity and a positive attitude to learn and implement new skills for an effective, productive, and successful life. And in this 18 hours, you will be learning uh, about nine principles of the model nine phases of the intervention and multiple applications that you may have. So I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and uh, send me an email to awarenessintegrationinstitute at gmail.com or fujanzane at gmail.com. I will love to hear from you and have you at our next course. Thank you. Is the tip of the week. I just read a statement on social media from someone who, with lots of anger and resentment, questioned self-love, loving another, and love of higher power. I read other people's comments about how people explain what love is to them. Depending on the tonality and the content, the words that were used in the message, I perceived how much a person was being resentful of love and was getting angry that others were enjoying love or fostering love. Working with couples for more than 30 years has revealed how the capacity of feeling and experiencing love allows one to receive it or avoid it, deny it, defy it, or even fight with it. This capacity of experiencing love shows itself in our friendships, 
romantic relationships, marriages, parenthood, social and political views and actions. Our first experience of love is with our primary caretaker or someone who lives with us, like our mom, our dad, grandparents, elders, siblings, nanny, or someone dear to us. Next, we experience love from our extended family members, neighbors, teachers, and someone in the community that cares for us as a mentor. As we go to school, we experience the love of friends, we fight over friendships, we create alliances, we have best friends, and we keep each other's secrets and form long-lasting relationships, which truly matters to us. From our teen years, uh, we experience romantic love, get attached, get dumped, get territorial, get rejected, reject others, experience euphoria, and then painful heartaches. As we become young adults, we learn that we need relational skills to foster, initiate, regenerate, express, and receive love from our mate. We grow with having children and experiencing love in a whole new dynamic with responsibility, creativity, play, mentorship, purpose, and much more. As we grow older and our children grow up, the love extends itself to our community and so on. When someone has received and experienced love in the various phases of life, they know it, they feel it, they recognize it have the capacity to hold it and can give and express love. However, if someone has not had the opportunity to experience love from their childhood era, one might feel awkward, suffocated, anxious, burdened, or even fearful of love. The relationship might become transactional and void of the notion of love. They might ridicule the notion of love and whoever requests it from them. They might run away when they're offered love as if it were a rope that would capture and then burden them. Some get lucky and meet someone who offers a safe, unconditional love and acceptance and has the patience to wade through all the ups and downs of the person until they test the love enough to finally trust the experience and become fulfilled by it. Usually, when we have not experienced love, it is also difficult to love ourselves. We might use our body or even abuse our body, punish ourselves and be on a path of destruction. Psychotherapy or coaching offers a space for a person to first experience acceptance of self and others and opens their horizon to love love of self, others, and beyond. The essence of life is love. So don't hold back, live with love. For more observational skills to see your patterns about love, get my book, The Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to create the life you want. Thank you. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Well, for all of you who are in an intimate relationship, in a marriage, you've had a bad one and you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into another one, but you really need some skills. Guess what? 
We're going to have a two-day workshop. It's going to be February uh, 26th and 27th, Saturday and Sunday, on Zoom, 12 hours on Zoom, two days. Um, it's called Us. The us in between. Awareness, integration, path to intimate relationship. We're going to look at you. How do you operate in an intimate relationship? What are some of the skills that are really, really needed to have an amazing relationship? It will be um, myself and two of my colleagues. I'm going to look at Herman, who's a, also a yoga teacher. We're going to teach you how to calm yourself down in an intimate relationship. When it, you get boggled up and you, you know all of what you've learned doesn't show up and all of the past path shows up and another coach and the therapist Dr. Arash Tagavi will be with us. So you're going to have three of us February 26th and 27th, 12 hours in Zoom. We'd love to have you there. So contact us at awarenessintegrationinstitute at gmail.com or fujanzain at gmail.com and uh, sign up. We'd love to have you. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and I am excited to have Lauren Reitzma. Um, she serves on the executive leadership team at Center for Relationship Education, the author of In Their Shoes. She regularly speaks on, for youth, adults, and corporate team. And Jonine McKenzie, she is an RN and a former first lieutenant in the USAF Nurse Corporation uh, Corps founded CRE which has certified more than 15,000 educators in its real essential relationship skills curriculum. She participates in national public health standards policy through numerous board membership. And today we will be talking about their book, Relationship Essentials, Skills to Feel Heard, Fight Fair, and Set Boundaries in All Areas of Your Life. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's beautiful to have the two of you, and you are mother and daughter, I, but that's, that was a, a pleasant surprise. <laughs> we'll let you guess which is who is who. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> so first of all, what got the two of you to want to write this book and share it? Was it the, the relationship between the two of you that inspired it, or the two of you and others that inspired the, to write and create these skills for others? It's a great question. I actually uh, co-authored this book with, I invited my mom to write with me when I, my publishing agent had called after the release of my first book, which was about kind of assimilating to a blended family after you'd been through divorce as a child. And I was one who was a, ch a child of divorce in my later teen years and really made it a life goal to learn relationship tools to prevent that legacy in my future. And I'm um, married now 15 years and have three kids. And one of the reasons that I feel like we've been successful is because we as vo a vocation uh, at the Center for Relationship Education have the opportunity to teach people hands-on relationship skills that can scientifically uh, and effectively improve the quality of your relationships. And so uh, when they asked if I could write a second book, I said, absolutely, I would be humbled to do so, but I don't want to take uh, pen to paper without the expertise of Janine, who happens to be my mom, but also founded CRE and uh, out of her own life trajectory is making life much more uh, easy to access relationship skills for generations to come. And so we just had the opportunity to uh, say yes to something new and post COVID with everybody distancing themselves, worrying about how to connect, needing connection more than ever, we thought it would be a really fun subject to dive into with some practical help. Absolutely, everybody needs this. Um, Janine, what uh, what was your inspiration to create the center? Well, it was so interesting. Um, years ago, back in the uh, early '90s, I was actually um, raising my children, and I saw I was also 
uh, very involved in the schools. And I was seeing bullying and people being mean to each other and all kinds of drama in relationships, not only in um, adult relationships, but also in young people. And so I, um, I thought, wow, we need to teach these kids some new skills. But um, really, how many of us have had relationship skills? I mean, we don't, there is no class for relationship skills. And I actually was very lucky and fortunate to find out that there was a repository of research about this at the University of Denver, a very new body of literature. And I parked myself there and uh, made friends with the professors at the Department of Psychology. And they gave, started giving me the skills. And I thought, I'm gonna put these skills into fun activities and teach these skills because when you know better, you do better. And it was about friendship and it was about family relationships and then romantic attachments and relationships in the workplace and uh, acquaintances like classmates. And so um, uh, Real Essentials was born. The Relationship Education and Leadership Curriculum was born. And that was in 1991. And now we're in 47 states and training teachers and uh, psychologists and social workers and all kinds of people to take this information and disseminate it in a broad way. It's so much needed. Uh, we were uh, babysitting for grandchildren this past weekend. And um, I was raised as an only child. So it was funny, I was looking at um, the different siblings and how they are relating to each other. And it dawned on me as a, as a uh, single child, as the one and only, you don't really get to do this at home because the world is about you and then it's about you know you and your parents pretty much um and so there's a power difference in what's going on and then i realized most of the firstborns who have a lot of different siblings they really get the the skills of how to handle and manage the other ones but then the fights between all of them it's almost like when you have siblings you 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 fall into a place that you have to survive these relational skills <laughs> one way another and not always in, a, um, in an appropriate way or in, in a healthy way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking this on and bringing it into the world, because I think everybody kind of needs it uh, one way or another if they haven't been able to learn it as they've been growing up. And that you're right that most of the time as we have schooling, they don't teach us these relationship skills. So everyone the book is Relationships Essentials, Skills to Feel Heard, Fight Fair, and Set Boundaries in All Areas of Life. So first, I know in your work, you've gone, talked about three C's that are so important, content, context, and connection. And um, I want to give you the ball to share about what are the differences and how come these three components are so important? I remember always getting advice when I was struggling in a friendship or when people just weren't hearing me and they would just say, you just, you just need to talk. You just need to talk. I mean, how many of you have heard the advice? You just need to be better communicators. And it dawned on us that there's so much more to just talking or simply communicate that, that has to be operationalized. So the three C's of communication was our attempt to really practically apply three different components of the in-depth communication cycle in a way that's memorable and easy to actually achieve. And so context is the first C, and that simply means, what are you going to say? Who, what words are you going to use? Who's going to be digesting this information and how will they understand it? Is there a language barrier? Is there, a, is there something that is sensitive to them? You need to know your audience. So content is simply what are the words that you need to transfer. Context is the next one. And that's thinking about the setting in which this message is coming through. Is this gonna be an email correspondence? Should you have this meeting face-to-face? -face? Should it be in public? Should it be in private? Should you have uh, limited distractions? Should, should it be, you have a neutral third party there? Is it toxic? Do you need help? What does the room in the environment in which you're going to send the message look like? And Honestly, a face-to-face -face conversation isn't the only context that is productive in communication. Sometimes it is simply a text message or a quick email. And then finally, once you know what you're gonna say, where and how you're, you're gonna deliver it, you have to make sure 
that it connects with the person you're trying to communicate with. So connection is simply a check-in to make sure, hey, did you hear that? Uh, did you receive that the way I intended it to? Was there any uh, maybe unintended consequence of what I said? And do you need to clarify how, how that landed? It's kind of just a quick, did you hear me? Help me understand what that looks like and reflecting, reflecting back. So it's a three-point check system. When you're fully communicating, you can check the three C's, content, context, and connection. And if you can make sure all three of those components happened, you're more likely to have had a thorough and meaningful conversation. Based on the converse, what you were saying, I've uh, noticed that many times, even with my clients, about with siblings or relations, relationship, parent, child, um, even at work area, that I've sometimes requested people to actually go ahead and email versus talk because if they get very aggravated and they can't really control their emotions and then it somehow their emotions hijacks the communication, I've actually asked them, you know, go email it and then you no. Know, first type it, then uh, dump it, then type it again and dump it and type it again until finally, this is truly what you want to say. And you you can see what the impact would be and then you know, hit the send. Um, so you write about the differences of, of uh, medium in what would be appropriate for us to, to actually converse about that. Anything you would like to add to this one before we go to the next, Joni? Well, communication is such a big word. And when Lauren said the word operationalize that concept, I don't know if a lot of people know what that means. And I, I kind of have a good example right now after COVID. We thought we knew how to wash our hands until COVID. And then the CDC spent millions of dollars messaging on how to break that concept of washing your hands into itsy bitsy pieces. And that's what we have done with this book. We take com abstract, complex, stated all the time concepts, communicate better. And we actually broke it down on how to do it. Beautiful. One of the most important factor also in, in your book is talk about boundaries. Many people have heard of the word boundaries, but they don't even know what that looks like. They don't know how to put it. Sometimes they uh, set the boundaries very harshly because they keep taking, 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 and then the frustration and anger shows up. And then when they want to set boundaries, it becomes really harsh. I remember I used to do that as a teenager and a young adult. I would be shy to say something that I didn't like. So I would just take it, take it. But then when finally I would say no, it would show up in such a harsh way that people were taken back and like, oh, okay. So, um, but then a lot of people also are afraid that if they set boundaries, it's going to be looked upon them as if um, they don't want to connect um, as someone who wants to be isolated. So there's so many myths around boundaries. And I like it that you present it as it's truly an act of kindness for yourself and others. So can you uh, share more about that? Well, one of the, well, I'll start with what the research tells us. When, when we actually looked at an educational study that um, had some new schools that didn't have any fences put up yet, and, and the education students from a local university said, I really don't want you to put up the fences quite yet. I want to see what the kids do without the fences. And they played very close to the school, which was very surprising to these education students. But as soon as they put the fences up, the kids went everywhere. They went all out with, with joy and, and knowing that they were safe. That's why it's kind, because it's safe. But boundaries are actually a protection for those who are given the boundary. And that's why we call it kind. And it's, it sets the tone of what you will accept and what you won't accept in a relationship. And I'll let Lauren com complete that thought. I, I We're very metaphorical. If you've read the book yet, or if you're just getting your hands on it, we use a lot of tool-based metaphors that are actual tools you would find in a toolbox. And I loved this epiphany that I had specifically for the measuring tape with, with a project. I was always taught, my grandfather was an architect, 
And he always said, you know, measure twice and then cut once. And what ends up happening in relationships is we're so, to your point, uh, Dr. Zane, there's, there's a lot of fear around if I set a harsh boundary here, if I, if I set a line, then people won't like me or I'll, I'll feel harsher. But the opposite is actually true. If you start to set a line and explain your why and create that, what you expect of yourself and other people, you end up only cutting once and having these beautiful structures in your relationships where you see problems is when nobody measures anything and that tape measure kind of pops back. And if, if that's ever happened to you, it actually can clip your skin and it hurts when you've broken a boundary, but we're afraid to say that hurt because we're worried. We're always worried and we need to create clarity and kindness and stopping people from having to guess and read our minds and just say, Hey, when I'm with Lauren, this is the boundary she sets. She has three kids under the age of 11. She works full time. She, when she says she's going to be on time for a meeting, she, she means five minutes early. And when she says I'm done, she actually will walk out of the room while you're still talking. It's not because she's mean. It's because she'll be late to her next thing. And she's communicated that boundary. And so as a, a, a mnemonic device, we want people to remember that tape, you know, time limits, auditory limits. What are you willing to hear? Uh, physical limits. What are your boundaries and physical touch and closeness with people? And then emotional limits. What, what are you allowing people to say and do that impacts your emotion? And if you let people hurt you over and over again, and don't set that boundary, it's part of your responsibility to take to take those lines and start drawing them, even if, if it's incremental, because everyone deserves to have and set healthy boundaries. Absolutely. I think that it creates a lot of clarity. Um, so uh, I know that in um, working with couples, uh, the conversations can go everywhere and they're constantly negotiating on boundaries because they live together. So they have to look at a partnership in every aspect of their life and how to create those um, standards or expectations or where the lines are. And um, you're absolutely right. Then when people don't do that, they'll cross boundaries and then they'll fight over it and then they feel hurt by it and uh, they have to come back and set the boundaries around it. So many times, you know, when we know what our boundaries are and we set it and we request it, it makes it easier. And then when we don't know half of the time what our boundaries are until it's crossed. And then sometimes, you know, we softly can come back and see this is just, just a boundary issue. It wasn't anything else. Like sometimes, you know, you're standing on a line and you think, it, like, like Jenny, what you were saying, I didn't know what a personal space was until COVID told us it was six feet, you know? Sometimes I don't know if you've had experience that you stand in a line and different people have agitation about, oh, this is too close. Like, I can't stand this. And this was even before COVID. So COVID has taught us, okay, just, you know, standardize and kind of wait to see what a personal space is. So people actually feel a little bit, um, you know, safe around it. So boundaries are important and you can all uh, really look at the defined aspect of it in this book. You talk about- Well, just to, just to give an example, I'll give an example for a married couple. You discussed a married couple. Uh, you know, I don't particularly care for violent movies. I don't like or scary movies. I just, it, 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 it affects my spirit and I just can't do it. And uh, early in my marriage, I told my husband that I'm not gonna watch scary movies and I'm not gonna, and over the course of many years being married, he, no, he, he said, I'm gonna ask you something. Oh no, no, I already know the answer. I already know the answer. Like, we, like, he's not even gonna bring up, let's go to this particular movie because he catches himself because I created a boundary. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not telling him he can't. You can go with your friends. You can go, you can go with you know, somebody else, but I'm not gonna go. And so he catches himself and that's the freedom that we were talking about. That's the, that's the kindness of it all. Yes. Um, I remember with one of the couples that I was working that the, the woman felt um, very much stuck and powerless in where the, the, her husband would start yelling and she couldn't yell back. She was powerless again, what was going on and kind of like would just fold and thought that she couldn't leave either. 
And so I was sharing with her, you could say, I can't control your mouth, but I can certainly control my ears and my space. And you're more than welcome to yell as much as you like in this room, but I do need to leave. And when you calm down, I can come back. Mm -hmm. And this just the set of boundaries where, yes, I can't control the world. I can't, I might not be able to set a boundary for the world. I might, and they might listen. And I'm going to definitely try and hopefully they'll listen. They'll respect it. But even if they don't, I can still set a boundary for myself and kind of like, you know, remove myself or feel power empowered to be able to do that. So, uh, yes, boundary is very important. And I'm so glad that you brought it up in, in your book and you're explaining it. Next point, uh, which is so important again in relatedness, like we cannot do this relatedness without this, which is your speaker listener technique. Can you share a bit about that? Well, you mentioned I actually, it's not our technique. I want to give all the credit to Dr. Scott Stanley Howard and Howard Markman at University of Denver. Uh, and we actually asked, asked them for permission and sourcing it because it's the best tool we've ever found to create those boundaries that are very unnatural, a little bit robotic at first, but that guarantee that both parties will have an opportunity to feel heard and to know that you're not looking for agreement, but you're really just trying to be understood. And so you can look up the speaker tech listener technique and they have a great, uh, they, they at DU have a wonderful tools that you can go even deeper with it. But we did publish it in the book uh, with Dr. Staley's permission and talked about basically the idea of when conflict is high, when emotion is high, when the prefrontal cortex is all bombarded with those stress hormones and cortisol, even the best communicators struggle to get through the weeds and, and find a way to stop the hurt and to stop that escalation. And this technique allows two people to play the role of one time as a speaker, the person who's delivering the message, and one time as a listener to say, I need to make sure I hear you. And we talk about uh, how you can utilize that technique as part of the third C of communication, which was that connection. And you can also use it to diffuse conflict when you're feeling misunderstood. So the basics of the technique is really just a reflection of one message being spoken, one message being validated through, through active listening, and then sharing that role. And it's really talked about in specificity uh, in, in the book and also on resources that you can look up online. Beautiful. Right. And, and, and it, it is, it, we have seen this work in such profound ways uh, in relationship coaching. And we, one of our workshops that we did, somebody was weeping and, and we went up to the person and said, what, why are you weeping? And they said, I've been married to this person for 22 years. And this is the first time I've truly felt heard. And that is, that is the essence of connection, is truly feeling like you're validated, you're known. And according to the research, the number one cause of relationship dissolution, and that's just not in a romantic place, it's in the workplace, it's family, it's friends. The, the number one cause of relationship dissolution is the inability to work through conflict. And this speaker listener technique is it's a set aside, you make an appointment, you, you sit down, like Lauren said, it could be uh, conceived as a uh, robotic at first, but it's such a great tool to really give and take and have that yin and yang. It's not agreement, it's not problem solving, it's feeling heard. Another um, sentence that is actually on your book, which is fighting fair. So as, as we're talking about this, um, I can see as I, again, I work a lot with uh, couples and um, siblings, uh, parent, child, uh, and also work, people uh, coming from their work environment. Fighting is something innately that happens when you feel your boundaries are crossed, when you feel your um, expectations are not met. Um, somehow, you know, people get angry and they show their anger in different ways. And if they... Um, and then another aspect of it is anger usually creates anger. And most of the time, even when you're kind of like going around your life going, and then somebody dumps their anger at you, immediately the experience is what, what? 
like, how dare you? And then it, you know, pumps your anger. And then you're trying to figure out all the ways that you were upset with them and how dare they be upset with you. So anger feeds anger consistently and fuels it. So when you're looking at um, in, in arenas that people are going to debate, are going to fight, um, there, there's supposed to be some rules. Like even if you go into a boxing ring, there's definitely rules in how you can, you know, where to punch and how to punch and what to do. And most people don't, uh, don't have any rules when it comes to fighting. They just go at it, you know, just they go for the throat. We've seen this even in the, you know, uh, beyond the, the small community that we have to the bigger communities now in social media, in media, everywhere. There is like punches coming at each other no matter what. Um, I have this group in a Clubhouse which, you know, everybody's sharing their world and they're saying their opinions. And these are all like, uh, you know, important um, uh, scientific opinions. And then suddenly some person appears to be pissed off at somebody else's conversation and then comes in with a rage and uh, telling the other person that you're just stupid and have no idea what you're talking about. And they vomit their anger all over. And then the fight begins with everyone. So you can really sense this, um, you know, how a fight begins. And you guys talk about how to do it fairly. So share with us. Our most helpful piece of advice there is we have to shift our lens from protecting our ego and protecting our pride to protecting our relationships. The minute you start to defend yourself, you tend to lose a relationship because relating in its core as a word means that you, you have two or more parties to have a relationship. Now you do have a relationship with self and you know, sometimes we do fight with ourselves, and that's a that's not a pretty picture in, in my opinion, when it's me. <laughs> I'll just speak for myself there. But most often when that anger and rage you're talking about rises up in it, it's defending pride and it's defending ego. It's not defending the person. And so one of the things that we like to look at with fighting fair is literally putting on safety glasses so that you can see conflict through a brand new lens. And one of the things I've learned as I've grown up and observed my own patterns of how I fight is I'm not willing to feel all of those negative emotions and really go after a fight with anyone if I don't care about what I'm fighting about. And so a lot of people talk about, well, why do you fight? And they, 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 say things like I fight because, you know, somebody ate a piece of my pizza or they stole a fry or they took, you know, they, they ran into me with their bike, whatever it is. No, that's what you're fighting about. Why you fight the motive is because you deeply care about something. And you talk to this, you spoke to this about your groups, those anger and, and defense mechanisms come out because people deeply care about their perspective. But if we can start caring more about people than our own individual perspective and have the decency to find middle ground. It's really, it's not compromising. It's not giving up passion, but it's actually believing that maybe we don't know it all. Maybe there's different perspectives in the world, different experiences, different views. And can we still be a populace that has enough respect for the human race to say, you know what? we see this differently and you care deeply about that. And I care deeply about you and I care about my opinion, but ultimately I care more about the health of this relationship than proving my point. And so we're just going to wash our hands and agree to disagree. We've lost that civil discourse in, in the human experience. We have uh, this past couple of years, it has been a lot, even in communities in families where having a difference of opinion has really disturbed relationships people have lost their relationship with like their best friends and people in the community and their uh, family because they couldn't tolerate somebody else's opinion to be as good as theirs, let's say. Um, Joni, would you like to share them on that one? Yeah. Our audio is not that good. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, uh, piggyback on yeah, I'm going to piggyback on what Lauren 
I think we're losing the audio on, on her. So I'm, we're going to go on until uh, the audio comes back and we could definitely hear you better. Uh, another aspect of the book. Is and so what, what, ha what happens sometimes is I'm so sorry that I know that Jonine, you're not in your normal space and office and uh, the audio is not really helping you. Um, so um, I'm going to go back at, at this point and, and ask, um, you talk about being interested, making, uh, makes you more interesting. There's, a, there's such a truth in that where when we come to a room, to a space, to a conversation, with the wonder, with an awe, with like, I really want to hear you. Like, I'm interested in you. Something opens in the connection that you were talking about that it automatically opens this kind of like this the tunnel of um, kind of love, acceptance, um, intrigued, the awness that we all have as a child, the wonder that we have to be able to gain information and uh, it really opens the path to communication. Can you share a bit about how you share this in the book? Lauren? Well, well can you hear me? Is this good? It's yes, Jane, okay. yeah, please, please. Yes, yes, okay. Well, that, that word, th those words, you are interest, interesting when you're interested, is uh, here's what happens. I, I teach kids communication with a little ball you know I did, did it when my kids were little I would throw the ball to them they would throw it back to me I throw a ball to them they throw it back to me and we keep doing that and then I would withhold the ball and they would get angry and they why aren't you not playing well communication is like that it's a little dance and when somebody keeps talking about themselves and they don't ask you a question about who you are that is like hogging the ball and it, it makes me think that they don't want to play. It's all about them. So that's why I brought that to the, to the table is that I kind of have a little rule on an airplane. I'll ask a couple of questions. Are you going home? Are you on business? And you are going on a trip. And then um, they'll, they'll answer those questions. And then if, in five minutes, if they don't ask me a question, I put my headphones on. I don't want to talk to this person. They're not interesting. They're not interested in me. They're not, in, they're not intellectually curious. I'm just going to put my headphones on and, and learn something new, <laughs> you know? So that's kind of where that came from. And it takes a lot of, we are to speak about insecurity versus security and what allows a relationship to flourish and being interested in someone else requires someone to have a foundation that they're secure in themselves. Cause typically talking about yourself is really just trying to fuel somebody to validate you. And if you can come into relationships knowing I'm validated, I know that I have security in myself, in this person, and I'm gonna make it my goal to make that person feel so good about themselves because I want it to be all about them. I don't wanna interrupt their cadence with things that I, I'm interjecting to try and prove myself. I want them to feel special. It's, it's, it's an act of hospitality in relationship to put someone else first. And that doesn't come naturally. Our brains put ourselves first because of that fight or flight and protection. But if we can train ourselves with skills to say, you know what, what would it look like if I went into that business meeting and made it all about the person I was talking to, you will quickly become the favorite in all of your relationship circles. And it really doesn't take that much skill. It just means you spotlight other people, you're interested in their story. And granted, hopefully they will throw the ball back and you'll get to share a couple things. But all of us have experienced that one relationship where they cannot stop talking about themselves or one-upping each other or proving that they're better. And usually when I hear that, it's a sign that that person needs to be validated and feel safe because they're just trying to temper their insecurity. They might not know it, but I can see that. And so be secure in yourself, put others first and be interested in others. And you will be a very interesting communicator. Beautiful. One of the things that I uh, read in your book, and I loved it because the model that I created, awareness integration, has a lot to do with being intentional, becoming aware of yourself and being intentional. And in your book, you talk about being intentional with your words, being intentional with your decision makings. Um, and um, 
it's so important when we are um, in our awareness of what it is that we want to create and how, what the impact will be versus just kind of live on automatic and then, you know, hit the impacts and then come back and like, oh, what happened? And then usually not feel responsible and accountable for how we brought that in. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, reading about that. Can you share about how to be intentional with your words and decisions? Well, I, we talked a lot about intent versus impact and the tool metaphor for that particular chapter you're referring to is a hammer and a nail. Because when you go to strike a, a nail with a hammer, if you're not intentional with your force and with your aim, you can still get the nail into the wood but sometimes it bends a little bit or it's, it's, not, it's not the strike that you wanted, but usually it remains hidden under the surface because you struck the nail and now it's bent all out of shape and it's stuck in the wood. And so we encourage people, whether intentional or not, or misintentioned or, uh, you know, hopefully people don't have malice and they intend to hurt. But a lot of people don't wake up saying, I can't wait to see who I can wound with my words, right? You probably need some, some helpful skill, skills and counsel if that's the way that you approach relationships. But a lot of the hurt in our relationships is really, it's not intentional, but nobody ever knows about it. And so I actually, just this yesterday, I was dropping off one of my kiddos with their grandparent and we exchanged some words at the doorway. And I said something that I just think hit her the wrong way. Like, how did that hit you is a question I ask her. And um, I walked away and I have a great relationship with my mother-in-law. Nothing ever really seems to go, you know, south unless uh, we're, I don't know, tired or hungry. One of those two things. But I walked away and I got in my car and I just had this gut check. And I said, I just need to check in and see like how, what I just said to her hit her. And I called her, I said, Hey, here's my intent. I wanted to just clarify this thing that had happened I don't think the words that I delivered really resonated how, how I wanted them to. Can I just check in and make sure that you're okay? And it was such a powerful conversation because she said, actually, yeah, I, I was hurt by how you approached it. What you said, and, and I was, I had had a really hard, heavy circumstance happen around me that she knew nothing about. And I got to share kind of the backstory of the setting of how I was coming into the conversation. I said, I didn't intend to strike you that way. I just, I needed to clarify that that your heart is okay. And that one five minute check-ins probably saved us six months of resentment and bitterness just by checking in and saying, hey, here was my intent. How did that hit you? And so we talk a lot about intent versus impact. And how cleaning up in that moment um, saved the relationship immediately. And um, to wrap it up, I also wanted to give this part to Janine, if you would talk about uh, the concept of uh, apologies and just saying, uh, you know, I'm sorry if you don't mean it, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, there is a chapter that you, you talk about actually, what apologies mean, what cleaning up means, what clarifying means. Can you share about that? Well, you know, when you're raising children, you know, and one child fights with the other child with their siblings, and the parent says, you did something that hurt your sister or your brother, uh, you need to say you're sorry. And so they just say sorry, and it's, they're doing it as it's perfunctory. It doesn't come from the heart. But what we do in the book is we actually lay out a operationalized the apology of that it has to come from the heart you have to you have to say something that you know I did not intend to do that um, I apologize will you accept my apology get their acceptance and then say I will be very careful not to do that again it, it's a process it's not just a one time I'm sorry um, and it, it, I think that that it, it restores the relationship when you do it in a certain way. There's many more steps and I'm gonna let Lauren build on that. I'm sorry really does fall short. And I always tell my kids, I'm sorry that I'm your mommy because I am gonna make you say a lot more than I'm sorry. <laughs> I love being their mom, but they have, they're gonna be in their own counseling for having a mom who's a communication expert, right? No, the idea of saying, I, we, we say, hey, sorry comes later, sorry comes later. That's an important part, but first you have to tell your brother or sister 
what did you do that hurt them? Period. What did you do? You don't just say sorry and walk away. You say, hey, I hit you. And I know that hurt your arm. And that is not something that I am supposed to do as a sibling of yours because I'm supposed to love you, right? And whatever, how mechanical it is, it's training them to take ownership. And I think forgiveness and apologizing really isn't about the words, it's about the ownership. And I think we are in a generation that's so afraid of saying I was wrong that we forget the power of reconciliation. So we're just urging people with little baby steps to say, why don't you just start by saying, here's how, here's what I did. Here's where I was wrong. Here's what I could do better next time before you just slap, I'm sorry on that. Uh, But ultimately that's really challenging, especially for some of us who've never experienced safety to be wrong and still be okay. Uh, So give yourself space, be kind to each other, practice saying it with people that you can have a little bit of humor, you know, and I was wrong for staying too long, you know, in the bathroom when I knew you were waiting outside the door, (laughs) whatever it is, it's just, you can add some humor as opposed to the really hard stuff that requires a lifetime of practice and achievement. Beautiful relationship essentials, everyone skills to feel heard, fight fair and set boundaries in all areas of life. Lauren Reitzma and Jonine McKenzie. One minute, Jules, anything we have left that we really want everybody to know? Well, just to wrap it up, I just think this is what matters in life. I go around the country, and in fact, that's why I'm here in in Northern Colorado. I'm doing a bunch of seminars, and hundreds of people, I ask the question, what matters to you? What matters? And you know what they all say? My relationships, my connection, my family. That's what matters. And then I ask the question, what are you grateful for? And it's the same thing. And in the human experience, relationships is the secret to happiness and health. The, there is all kind of the, the Harvard human flourish, the Harvard study on happiness, it, 75 year study says it, it's the quality of your relationships that keep you healthy and happy. And there's a lot of people around that are not happy and not living in abundance and not living their best life. And having healthy relationships is essential. Beautiful. Thank you. And I would close it out just to say that to do what Janine was just talking about was so vital to actually utilize the tools. I think we can get really prideful in this work. We're not experts. I mean, we, we have expertise, but if we don't pick up the hammer and hit the nail on the head, then we don't build walls either. So no one in the world gets a pass on working on your relationships. Everyone who knows anything about humans knows that we're constantly needing to grow and to be accountable. And so we always like to just, we start with ourselves. And if we're not practicing the tools that are in those chapters, our relationships suffer. So we're all in this together and we're so grateful to have a a voice to be able to speak to encourage others as well. I love what you just said. It doesn't matter how much you know the skills. If you're not using it every day, it's still not going to work. So Uh, knowing it is different than utilizing it every single time. And when you do, it works. It really does. So please, everyone, go to myrelationshipcenter.org to um, connect with Lauren Reitzma and Jonine McKenzie and go get the book, The Relationship Essentials, Skills to Feel Hurt, Fight Fair, and Set Boundaries in All Areas of Life. Thank you so much, ladies, for uh, taking the opportunity and being on my show. It was our pleasure. Thank you for having us. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.